Right, hello there, my name is Kieran Donnelly. The intention of this video is to accompany the report for my minor dissertation uh, for the MSc in Data Science degree. The topic, the development of a test suite for single object tracking algorithms in video. So we'll get into what that means. I was uh, supervised by Etienne Pinar of the statistics department at UCT. Flycam um, is part of uh, the SSAP or Sony Startup Acceleration Program in the Sony office in Lund, Sweden. So I got the opportunity to go out there to carry out the research for my master's dissertation. Flycam's intention is to provide paying customers with an automated drone videography service. The idea is, you know, the customer shows up at the ski resort or the mountain bike park, or whatever it is, uh, they order their drone, they go about their activity as usual and the drone follows them. So we identified that object tracking is the primary obstacle um, to enabling this autonomous videography service. The tracker that we ultimately need to settle on as, as, as part of the Flycam team needs to uh, satisfy certain conditions. That is, it needs to be very fast, so it needs to perform in real time. It needs to be very accurate, so it can't lose track of that, of that athlete. And it needs to be reliable, such that if it does lose track of it, it can find it again by some, by some other means. So I set out to determine the best way to find what the best tracker was of all the existing tracking algorithms out there. So the second chapter in the report deals with uh, a deep dive into what we call object detection. So you need to locate an object in the frame of a video in order to be able to, to track it. Typically, um, convolutional neural networks are really coming to the fore. Uh, they're very well suited to, to tasks like object detection. The reason for this is that they are very applicable for sort of ordered or, or spatial data like uh, the pixels uh, in an image occur. Very quickly the way it works is a small thing called a kernel which is a type of uh, matrix normally three by three is passed over an image and uh, essentially it flares up and, and produces a signal when it finds a feature that it was uh, designed to, to look for. That's known as the convolution operation and once the entire image has been convolved over by this kernel or some number of kernels, we end up with a huge amount of, of, of data, very high dimensionality. We've got loads of pixels in an image and we need to get that down somehow. So there's an additional step in the convolution operation called pooling, typically max pooling. And the idea of max pooling is to reduce the dimensionality from sort of millions of pixels in this image uh, to some smaller, more manageable size uh, while still preserving that spatial information. So we need those pixels and those features to always be in the same relative positions uh, relative to each other um, and pooling preserves that spatial uh, information and, and similarity. So once we understand object detection, we can start sort of looking into video tracking. Video tracking, very loosely put, is the, the process of locating an object over time in video. So there was sort of three primary categorizations into which um, video tracking models or algorithms could be, could be placed. The first is, is the model detection free or is it detection based? That's referring to the initialization method. So does the model in every single frame trying to detect a new object and then try and link that to previous objects and find the similarity between them? Or does it find an object in only the first frame and then try and use some other aspect of that of that particular object to try and track it through the frames without re-detecting in every frame? The next segmentation or categorization that we can make is what's called processing mode. So this is either online or offline. Online means that essentially the data or the video sequence or stream is coming in in real time and you only have historic frames uh, to, to look at. Offline tracking means you've got an entire sequence of frames up front and you can look forward essentially to find out uh, what's coming. So the last categorization that we can make is, so is it deterministic or probabilistic, i.e. if you ran this tracking algorithm uh, on the same clip a hundred times, would you have exactly the same output every single time? Uh, in, in which case it would be deterministic or is it probabilistic or stochastic in that of a hundred times you would have sort of some central tendency of, of output but there would be sort of tails either way where sometimes the tracking went awry and sometimes it worked perfectly and, and whatnot. So once we know about how to segment uh, different object tracking algorithms the next step was to determine some way of evaluating all of these different tracking algorithms that are out there. So we elected to develop some evaluation metrics, so a set of, of calculations or computations that we can use to see how each algorithm or model performs uh, on some defined test data. We bring in some annotated video data, and when I say annotated, I mean the object in each particular frame of that video has been given a bounding box. Those are called the ground truth 
bounding boxes or the ground truth objects when we run a tracking algorithm on that video sequence it makes what we call a hypothesis now that we've got the ground truth bounding box which we know is correct and we've got the hypothesis which is the output from our tracker, where does it think the object is, we can compare those. So we based most of these tracking metrics on a distance metric. So the first thing that we looked at was how far is the centroid of the ground truth bounding box from the hypothesis that the tracking model has made. Now in graphic processing and image processing, there's a quite a well-defined uh, metric to determine overlap and it's known as intersection over union. So if we just jump over to the report itself over here and take a look at figure 3.2, we can see that the intersection between two bounding boxes is the area where those two rectangles overlap. And then we've got a thing called the union, which is the total area that those two bounding boxes take up, counting the overlap only once. The intersection over union metric is exactly what it sounds like, and that gives a very reliable means of, of determining overlap. The actual algorithms that we, that we endeavored to to try and test and evaluate for this particular project. So we used uh, the OpenCV in Python implementation uh, and it includes eight sort of reasonably good, some of them okay, uh, tracking algorithms. It included a tracker within the OpenCV set of trackers called GoTurn, which stands for Generic Object Tracking Using Regression Networks, which is a neural network based regression model which is quite interesting in the sense that it takes pairs of images during its training process, one of which has the image at time t with the object and the bounding box uh, positioned around it, and the next image of the pair is where that object has moved to at time t plus one. And essentially the model then, the neural network can actually learn a sort of generic idea of how objects move. It doesn't need to understand exactly what they look like, but just uh, the way in which objects move in general. Moving on to the data, so the test data that we that we looked to um, use for this particular project was all uh, drone video data, so drone video clips of, of people doing various activities, one or two of them were objects, so filming a car moving across a, um, a landscape. Let's take a look at a few of them. We'll just jump through. So we've got a, quite a few cycling ones. Uh, a lot of the use case uh, that was intended by Flycam was for mountain bike parks, so quite pertinent. A lot of them obviously very bright colors, quite pixelated at times, um, very messy sort of in the shadows. Object tends to be quite small relative to the overall size of the frame. This one potentially is a particularly easy one. The colors don't change too much and the, and the motion is very slow. Car tends to stay in the center of the image. Then we had a couple of uh, skiing ones. So this is typically quite easy because of the contrast between object and, and snow. But what does happen is that they start moving very quickly and, and tend to move away from the drone such that the target gets very small and gets difficult to track. So that's what sort of a little bit of the test data looks like. There were 18 clips in total. The crucial point here is that these videos were unannotated. The problem is that the metrics that we define and earlier the evaluation metrics require a, a set of ground truth bounding boxes in order to uh, determine the performance of a, of a tracking algorithm. So that led us to designing an algorithm which automated the annotation process of, of all of these clips. Very briefly, algorithm one in the report, what it does is it uh, iterates through all of the frames in a video. It looks for all of the objects in a particular frame, places bounding boxes around them, records the positions of all of those bounding boxes as well as the type of object that it thought it recorded and a confidence value for that detection. Then it would filter those object detections such that only person or human object detections remain. Those were the only ones we were interested in. Once that was done, of course, the object detection algorithm that we used wasn't perfect. Sometimes frames were either missed or they were misdetected, which means that an object was detected and, and with a high confidence and it wasn't actually there or it was just missed completely. So then I would manually loop through those those incorrect frames and, and see if a incorrect uh, detection had in fact been made. Now we've got annotated video data and we can start doing some things with it. So we've got something like nine trackers defined, 18 different video clips, they're all annotated and we've got 10 metrics. What we need now to determine which of these uh, things combine together the best is we need a set of, of observations for each of those 10 metrics for each tracker running on each of the clips in the, in the test data. So we came up with a sort of intuitive algorithm which carried out these steps. It's algorithm three in the report. The idea very briefly is that that algorithm runs a tracking algorithm on a particular clip 
and uh, it records the metrics for that clip and then it repeats that for all the videos. Another step we included in that algorithm is for each video that a tracker runs on, we would resize that video to three different resolutions such that we could determine whether the performance of a tracker was related to the size or the, or the dimensions of a, of a particular video clip or not. After running all of those tracking algorithms on all of the video clips at three different resolutions per video clip, we ended up with 375 observations. We summarized those, those results by, by two primary means. Um, first of all, tabulating by tracker to determine the performance of each tracker. Of course, that is the primary uh, purpose of the, of the research. And then we also tabulated those results by clip to see which clips had the highest performance on them. Obviously, those would have been the more easier to track clips. So jumping over to the report again. So what we've done here is categorized the results first by tracker and within that tracker then in the particular resolution group. And then within each of those resolution groups for a particular tracker, we've got the average of that particular metric in a cell for all of the clips on which that uh, algorithm and uh, resolution was run. Then the other thing we've done is, is shaded in the cells with the with a shade of, of between blue and white. So the darker the shading in a cell, the more optimal it was. And the bold value in each particular column is the highest performing uh, result in that particular column. So to summarize the results that we that we uh, that we found after looking at those observations and, and grouping them in those tables, we determined a couple of things. So the KCF or the, the kernelized correlation filters, the results there were somewhat misleading. So it had the darkest shading in the table by far, which meant that all of its uh, all of its results were were optimal. The problem was that the KCF algorithm is very good at self-reporting failure. In other words, it says, okay, I've reached a frame where I can no longer continue to track. I've, I'm determining that I have failed to 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 track this object any further and the other thing is that it's not very good at tracking for very long so it would often fail uh, and therefore the duration or the amount of frames over which those results were calculated was, was quite small and therefore the results were almost always uh, very good. CSRT was, was promising across the board this was the one that the team at Flycam actually implemented from the get go and this was the one that we were sort of testing the, the drone flight and early algorithms with anyway so it was good to see that the, that the evaluation metrics agreed with that. Last but, but certainly not least, the RE3 tracker, which stands for Recurrent Real-Time Regression Tracker, uh, was great in, in almost all respects. The only drawback was that it ran at, at a reasonably sl slow speed. Of course, in the real-time use case in the in the application of Flycam we intend to have a very capable uh, on-site server doing this this tracking so we anticipate that we will be able to get that speed up a lot higher let's take a look at some of those um, re3 results and just see how how impressive it was so these are all the the 1280 by 720 pixel so this is the mid resolution group and we can see that it almost never fails this one from above very small target object didn't uh, struggle at all with that this one as well moving all over the place quite a messy background um, all of these cycling ones it tended to do quite well on this one was problematic only because the rider goes behind a tree and at that stage the tracking algorithm doesn't really know what to do the car one most of them perform very well on this um, this was one that very few of the trackers could actually succeed on so this was very impressive that it was able to do so well here against a messy background low resolution quite pixelated uh, was able to track that all the way into the into the splash the skiing ones were, were equally good so this is a very high frame rate video it was 4k and 60 frames a second and it was able to track despite the very small nature of that uh, target object this was one of the more challenging videos especially towards the end as he goes into the shadows and uh, re3 was was very good here as well uh, skiing one this one was particularly tricky it pixelates quite a lot as the skier crosses the wake and almost all the tracking algorithms start confusing the skier with the with the boat or the wake at some stage i mean this one was particularly good considering how the target object changes uh, appearance and and uh, rotates throughout the video that was very interesting the surfer actually disappears into the barrel a couple of times and the uh, algorithm actually manages to pick up that surfer again purely by chance i would imagine because the surfer happened to go back to the point where the last uh, tracking was lost so that's a very high level summary not going into too much detail especially as as it pertains to uh, sort of convolutional operations and, and all of those things inside the neural networks and the actual development of the evaluation metrics as well. I was a bit uh, 
that got a bit hairy but uh, hopefully that gives you some nice context um, for the project and if you're going to read the report uh, you know help you along with the with the storyline somewhat thank you very much for watching and i hope that uh, fly cam comes to a ski resort or, or bike park near you sometime soon